Hello, everyone. <clears throat> So I, I hope all of you are done with the quiz. So let us start our lecture. Are you ready? Okay, <clears throat> so let us start. So last time uh, we ended the lecture at the definition of algorithm in uh, uh, trust Turing thesis. So we will begin our discussion with the, with the same theme. So I told you that uh, around 1900s, in the year 1900, uh, David Hilbert, posed a list of uh, 25 questions, right? So he posed, uh, proposed that by the next, I mean, in the next 100 years, by the year 2000, uh, we would be able to solve uh, these questions. And on this list of problems, there was a problem which is which is listed at the number ten, which is now famously called uh, Hilbert's tenth problem. Uh, which it is now it is now called Hilbert tenth problem. So let us talk about what is this problem. Okay. So Hilbert said he he wanted to come up with an idea that given any polynomial, in multiple variables, okay. given any polynomial with in multiple variables of any degree uh, with integer coefficients. So, so the question was that given any such polynomial with multiple variables, such that the coefficients of the polynomial are all integer, is it possible? Is it possible to find all integral groups? Okay. So before we begin, let us describe what is a polynomial, right? Uh, so for example, I can say that 2x squared plus 3x minus 1 is a polynomial. Okay, this is one polynomial. This is a quadratic polynomial. It's a quadratic polynomial in one variable, and that variable is x. Right? We can have other polynomials. For example, uh, 3x squared plus Four y y square minus five x y plus five. This is also a quadratic polynomial in variables x and y because the maximum degree of any variable is two. So we have two here, two here. So one plus one is two. So the maximum degree is two. So it's it's degree two polynomial with two variables. Uh, we can also have uh, polynomials in, uh, in three variables, four variables, five variables, and any number of variables. For example, a squared plus b squared minus c squared is one such polynomial, uh, which we all know by Pythagorean uh, theorem. For example, if this is a right angle triangle, let's call it a, b, and c, then this has to be zero, right? So this is one polynomial. 
So polynomials come in all shapes and degrees and number of variables. So the question was that given any such polynomial, possibly in multiple variables, with integer coefficients. So, so these numbers are called coefficients, right? So this two is a coefficient, three is a coefficient, minus one is a coefficient uh, because the power of x is over here is zero, right? So given any polynomial with integer coefficients of any degree, we need to find out if integral roots exist. So what is meant by a root? For example, if I say that x squared plus three, let's say, let, let's take even simpler polynomial. Let's say if I say x minus one equal to zero, then this is a polynomial of degree one in just one variable. So there is one possible solution to this polynomial or integral root that is x is equal to plus one. So this is a solution which will make this polynomial equal to zero. So if I, if I say that uh, x equal to one, uh, then one minus one is zero and that's perfectly fine. So usually polynomials are written like this. If let's say p of x is a polynomial, and let's say it is x squared plus two x plus one. Okay, x squared plus two x plus one. Is there any uh, is there any value of x? Is there any value of x which will make P of x equal to zero. Okay, so we need to figure it out. So if we make p of x equal to zero, so we would say, okay, we would say, okay, p of x equal to zero. It means that x squared plus two x plus one is equal to zero, and we would find that x is equal to minus one is one possible solution. Right, so minus one squared plus two times sir. minus one plus one is one minus two plus one, which is equal to zero. Yes. Sir, Any questions? Uh, can can we email you the quiz uh, if it wasn't submitted on time? Why why it was not submitted on time? Sir, I submitted on the, in the last moment. Uh, usually it gets accepted in seven o five, but this time it didn't get accepted at seven o five. Why did you wait till seven o five? Yes. Sorry, sir. Can you extend for two minutes, or we can? I can email you or something. You can email me. But yeah, but right over there. Okay. Sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, so we now know that there are polynomials, and there are uh, polynomials with integer coefficients, and then there are polynomials with with roots. For example, if I say I have a polynomial which is uh, again a quadratic polynomial. Uh, but this time it is x squared in minus three, right? So the question is, is there any integral root of this polynomial, right? So for example, if you say that x squared minus three is equal to zero, this me means x squared is equal to three, which means x is equal to square root of plus minus square root of three, which is not an integer. Right? So this polynomial p of x has no integral roots. So it means that some polynomials have integral roots, while others don't have integral roots. Okay. So the question is, given any polynomial, okay, given any polynomial with integral coefficients, so over here the coefficient is one, over here it is minus three, with integral coefficients, is it possible to find integral roots? Okay, or is it possible to know that the roots of the polynomial are integral? So this was the question which was considered to be the 10th question on, on this list. And Hilbert wanted to find out that can we devise a method, can we devise a mechanism uh, which we can use to test uh, whether a polynomial has an integral root or not, okay? So he did not use the term algorithm, but eventually what he wanted was to find out an algorithm that given a polynomial P, 
in so let's say variables x, y, and it is better to write it this way. Suppose x1, x2, xk. So let's say this is the polynomial in k variables. Given such a polynomial, is it possible to find out if p has integral roots? Okay. So he wanted to know about such a solution. So he wanted to find out such a mechanism, a procedure, an algorithm that, that we would use to test such a thing. At that time, the concept of the algorithm was not fully understood and fully formalized. So mathematicians of that time could not solve this question in a sense that, because they did not know even, they did not understand what an algorithm is. So they, they attempted to solve this question, but their attempts failed. And they did not know if they, they, were, if they were failing, it, would be, it was because they, uh, they did not try it hard enough or there was no solution. So they could not come up, to, come up with the, that conclusion. So the answer, a partial answer to this question came in 1936 uh, when Church and Turing, Alan Turing, came up with their notion of effective computation. So they came up with a notion of effective computation. So Church came up with lambda calculus. Okay. And Turing, so this was by Church. And by Turing, Turing invented machines, which now we call Turing machines. And as, as we discussed Turing machine, we went uh, quite at length that what is a Turing machine, we can formally describe what is a Turing machine, how does it uh, do computation, then the various different aspects and versions and variants of, of Turing machine and so on. Uh, but at that time, Turing actually described that what is a Turing machine and the description of a Turing machine could be very, dis I mean, could be, it could be very formal. Uh, I mean, you can define it in a very low level terms or you can define it in a higher level terms, right? So what actually this, this machine concept, the Turing machine concept was that it was defining an algorithm. So now we know in, in, in the quiz as well that you do not have to come up with a graphical representation of a machine that would solve the problem. Uh, rather, any descriptive algorithm was enough which would show that uh, what this Turing machine is doing, right? So Turing machine, uh, the concept of Turing machine described what is an algorithm and it described what is an effective computation. So together with this lambda calculus and Turing machine, it is now called church Turing thesis. So what this church Turing thesis tells us, so church Turing thesis tells us that, that everything that can be computed, everything that we know about computation equals, uh, equals Turing machines and algorithms. So we say that this, this uh, church Turing thesis says that that the, the intuition we have about, uh, I mean, intuitive notion of, of computation is same as, by definition, Turing machines, okay? Or lambda calculus. And we, we can prove it, we can extend it to any other computational model that we can come up. There are many other computational models uh, besides Turing machines and lambda calculus, which we can include in this list. And all these models are equivalent. So you can replace any model here with any other equivalent model, and they would still be same about the intuitive notion of computation. So what does it mean by, what, is, what does it mean by intuitive notion of computation? It means that anything that we can think about computation, anything for which we can come up with an algorithm, anything for which we can devise a machine or an effective procedure which solves that problem is basically the intuitive notion of an algorithm or computation. Right? And for that algorithm and computation, we can always devise a Turing machine or we can devise, a uh, we can devise an algorithm. Now, at that time in 1930s, we did not have the physical computers that as we know now. So we did not have electronic computers. There were some basic primitive kind of computers, 
but no such computers uh, exist at that time. Uh, but still, we came up with Turing and Church and other uh, mathematicians came up with this notion of computation. And the notion was so, uh, I mean, what, what you can call it, it was so comprehensive that whatever that he could think, not in that time, not now, but forever about computation and forever about uh, algorithmic thinking can be captured by Turing machine. And that is actually a very uh, profound uh, kind of uh, intuition and profound uh, achievement by humans uh, of our time. Yes, uh, everything computed by lambda calculus will also be computed by Turing machine, yes. Yeah, they are also equal. So they are all equal. So, so Church and Turing came up, independently came up with different, uh, different models of computation. Uh, one of them was the lambda calculus, the other was uh, Turing machine. So we don't cover lambda calculus in, in this course on automata. Uh, I covered lambda calculus in, in one other course last semester. Um, but lambda calculus is, is again, very interesting area of computation. And if you are more interested in knowing about lambda calculus, uh, then you can search for lambda calculus. And if you are familiar with JavaScript, then JavaScript actually provides almost one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between programming. Uh, I mean, the JavaScript is, some of the JavaScript can be converted into lambda calculus uh, format. So Lambda calculus and JavaScript are very friendly in a sense that you can go between uh, one of them. So if you know JavaScript, uh, then you know some Lambda calculus, not necessarily because JavaScript is a very special kind of programming language, which provides multiple ways of doing exactly the same thing. Uh, so there are multiple ways. So one is a very simple iterative procedure, which, is, which looks like Java or C or Python. And, and then there is an alternate way of doing it, which is very lambda calculus way. So lambda calculus uh, is, is, is a kind of programming. So if you are familiar with any functional programming language, are you familiar with any functional programming language? For example, Haskell, uh, parts of JavaScript, not completely, but parts of JavaScript or list or ml and there are many other functional programming languages f sharp is also one of the uh, um, functional programming languages so these are the functional programming languages and these functional programming languages have very close relationship with lambda calculus and lambda calculus and lambda functions are so important and so uh, i mean useful that many non functional programming languages such as c++ in java and rust among others, I think also Python somehow provide functionality, which we call Lambda functions. Okay. So you can create Lambda functions in Java or C++ or Rust or Python. So Rust is very much inspired by functional. It's not a functional programming language, but it is very much inspired by functional programming. So it also provides mechanisms where you can implement or you can use Lambda functions. And lambda functions are basically the building blocks in lambda calculus. Anyway, so this was just a side note, distraction. So we were talking about church Turing thesis, and church Turing thesis tells us that anything that you can think about computation can be described by a Turing machine, or can be captured by lambda calculus, or it can be described or captured, or, or uh, I mean, solved by any can, any model of computation that we can think of. And so there are many other models of computation which are equivalent to Turing machines or equivalent to lambda calculus. And since all these uh, computation models are equivalent among themselves, so if you just prove that one of these, uh, one of the new computation model is equivalent to Turing machines, then you are, are uh, in the safe uh, zone, right? So it means that that model is equivalent to every other model. And that, that is the church Turing thesis. So we call it a thesis. So there is a difference between a thesis and a theorem. Do you know the difference between the word thesis and theorem? Yes. 
Anyone? Yes, theorem is proven. It's a fact. It's, it's, it's well known, it's proven, we know how to prove it. Thesis is a statement, which may not be true, okay? Which means that it is not yet proven. Or it is a statement which cannot be proven, okay? Or it, so it, it either means that we have not been able to solve it right now, or it also means that there is no solution, there is no proof for such a statement, but we do not know which one is the case. So charge theory thesis is a thesis because we do not know a proof for that. Even though there is no proof for it, but there is a consensus among all mathematicians and computer scientists and physicists and every other, uh, any other person who works with computers that charge theory thesis actually describes all possible computers. And the reason for that is that it, it's a kind of cyclic definition because we define the notion of computation to be something that can be done by a Turing machine. And then we say that whatever that the steering machine does is actually computation. And that is, and everything that cannot be done by a Turing machine or any other equivalent computation model is not computation. Or it's not, it's, it's outside the notion of computation or algorithms. So it's a kind of uh, cheating. It's kind of uh, a circular definition, uh, but that is okay. The problem is that um, since we do not know any other way of, of, of proving it, it, we do not know any other way of describing it or any other way to show or, or think about what actually computation is, then this is fine for us, right? So that's why initially I think in, in previous lectures I, I mentioned that, uh, that maybe this church Turing thesis is not universal. It is possible that it is not universal. Uh, maybe some other civilizations, maybe they are they are advanced enough, uh, and they have achieved some levels of computation far greater than uh, what we actually know now. Uh, and probably they they know computation from a very different perspective, and their idea of computation would differ from our idea of computation. So, so it is possible that their ideas are different from such thesis, and if they are not different from what we think about such thesis, then basically that is a very pessimistic result, uh, but not just pessimistic, but in a sense that it's, it's a profound result that we found something which we cannot prove right now, which is universal. So it's a profound at the same time as pessimistic. Uh, so we do not know which one is the case because we haven't uh, encountered any alien civilization. So, so one day once we find them, we probably uh, would, ask them how they perceive computation. Anyway, so uh, so the church Turing thesis provides the precise definition of an algorithm, okay? And this precise definition of algorithm is necessary uh, to resolve the Hilbert span problem, right? So with this 1936 uh, definition of, uh, of lambda calculus in Turing machine, it took another like 30 years uh, for another mathematician a Russian mathematician, Yuri Matsevich. I don't remember his spelling. So Yuri Matsevich is a Russian mathematician. He came up with a proof in 1970 that it is impossible to devise such an algorithm which will, which will show for any given polynomial in multiple variables and integral coefficient that such a polynomial has an integral proof. So, so how does it, how did he uh, approach that uh, algorithm is beyond the scope of this course, uh, but I will give you some details, okay? Uh, so I will give you some details. So, so let us formalize it. So we can rephrase the Hilbert stand problem in our modern terminology of Turing machines, okay? And the modern terminology of, of languages. Suppose D is a language, okay? And this language D consists of all those polynomials P such that polynomial is, such that P is a polynomial with an integral root. Okay, 
So you can say our sigma contains zero, one to nine. It contains plus, it contains minus, it contains exponentiation, it contains x, uh, let's say x1, x2, and xk variables, and some other uh, things, for example, right? And now we can construct a polynomial with these symbols, and we would include such a polynomial in the set D if and only if that polynomial has an integral root. For example, uh, p of x is equal to x squared minus one. So this polynomial has an integral root, right? Uh, q of x is equal to two x minus two. This polynomial also has an integral. Root. So all such polynomials which have integral roots will be included in this case. So the question would be, we, we ask this question, is D decidable? So when we ask that is D decidable means, is there a Turing machine which given P over this sigma, decides if P belongs to D or P does not belong to D, okay? So, okay, so how would you come up with such a Turing machine? So I will give you one simple example, okay? So D is such a big language, so we would say, okay, forget about D, let's consider another language which we call D1. And this D1 is a language which consists of all polynomials such that polynomial P is a polynomial over X, just one variable with an integral, okay, with an integral. Can, so, so the question is, is D1 decidable? Okay, we can actually decide D1, very simple, okay? So first, let me give you a Turing machine which recognizes it, then I would give you, uh, I would give you a Turing machine which decides. Uh, can we use discriminant? At least we can show if the solution is real. Uh, discriminant is only good for quadratic equation, right? Quadrat quadratic polynomials. We are not talking about quadratic, we are talking about all polynomials of any degree power three, power four, power five, power six, power seven. And there is another result in algebra, which is which is very old result. It is due to Abel. Abel was a mathematician. Uh, he gave a result that for every polynomial of degree five and above, there is no closed form formula, which gives us a solution or the roots of, of, of the equation. So it is impossible. Okay. We cannot construct a formula. For example, if I give you a polynomial, x squared plus bx uh, plus c, a, c equal to zero. For example, it's a quadratic equation. I, I know there are two roots. Uh, the first one is x plus minus b squared, sorry. So I know there are two roots. x is either equal to b plus b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a, or x is equal to minus b minus square root of b squared minus four AC divided by two. So these are two possible roots. And you can find them because the power of this polynomial, the maximum degree of this polynomial is two, right? For three, it is somehow possible. For four, we, can, we know some formulas which can change the, the polynomial into two polynomials of a power two, and then we can apply the quadratic formula to find out. Uh, but for any polynomial of power five, of degree five and above, uh, there is no such formula. We cannot even come up with such a formula. And there's a very, I mean, elegant proof due to Abel. Abel was a mathematician. Uh, and there's, um, there is a prize in uh, Abel's name, which we call Abel's prize in mathematics, which is uh, somehow equivalent to, uh, somehow equivalent to Nobel prize in mathematics because there is no Nobel prize in mathematics. So Abel uh, came up with um, uh, this, this result. So no, so we cannot do discriminant, right? So it will solve only uh, for only small 
parts of 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 the uh, strings over here, not everything else. So let's talk about D1. So let me write D1 here again. Okay, and I, I will just show you how to recognize, it and then we will go for the for the brain. So D1 can consists of all the polynomials. Uh, P such that P is a polynomial over X, just one variable, such a red. X, uh, such that P has integral. So it's very easy to come up with a Turing machine. Let's consider M1. Okay, M1 is um, a machine. We say that on input, on input P, so we know that P is a polynomial of, over variable P, do one thing, evaluate P, with x set successively to the values zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, and so on and so forth. Since we are only interested in, in the integral roots, roots, so the root could be zero or plus one or minus one, or plus two or minus two or plus three and minus three and so on, right? So the roots are like this one. So what you would do, you set the value of X equal to zero and check, evaluate if it, if it evaluates to zero or not. If it doesn't, then check plus minus one for first plus with plus one, then with minus one, then with plus two, then with minus two and so on and so forth. If at any point, if at any point, P evaluates to zero, P of X is equal to zero, then accept, right? Then accept. And this is a Turing machine. So we say that M1 recognizes D1. It does not decide, but it recognizes. Uh, and now we will go to, to break, but when we come back from the break, we will see that how can we convert this M1 uh, to, to decide, we can do that. It's not difficult, we can do that. We can convert this machine M1 to decide. So right now it just recognizes and I, I hope that you understand and you see that why it recognizes and not decides uh, because uh, the root could be too big. For example, it, it's, it's, it's very large. So we do not know when the answer will come, right? And it is also possible that there is no such root. Since it is possible that there is no such root, then we might be, so we, in, in that case, we would be keep testing for zero and one plus one, uh, plus one minus one, plus two minus two, plus three minus three, and we will never end, right? And, uh, and we will never be able to come up with a solution. Uh, there's another suggestion that we, maybe we can do fact, factorization. No, we cannot do that because uh, it isn't, so as I said, Ebel's formula, Ebel's method, Ebel's theorem says us, tells us that it is impossible to factor any polynomial of degree five and above in a general form. So for any, some specific polynomials, we can do that. But if, if I write the, the polynomial in X with degree five and above a general polynomial, for example, the general polynomial in degree five would look like uh, AX square, uh, AX power five plus BX power four plus CX power uh, three plus BX square plus EX, uh, plus f equal to zero, there are six terms over here, right? So, and, and the maximum power is five. You cannot write a general formula to find out the roots. You cannot find a general formula which gives us a factorization. It's impossible, okay? So, and that result is from 19th century, way before Hilbert came up with this list. So it was well known uh, to mathematicians. Anyway, so we know that this machine M1 recognizes D1, it does not decide, uh, but we will change, we will make small changes in this machine and then it will start um, uh, deciding, right? Rather than uh, recognizing it, but we will do it after the break. So it's 7.35, so let's all come back around uh, 7.15. Okay. Um, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, I want to talk to you about something. So all the quizzes and presets that you've been giving, the questions in them are relatively hard. 
for us. So uh, we were hoping if you could somehow maybe conduct a tutorial or something, because we, we're uh, seeing a lot of difficult questions that we cannot really solve. So, so in the past, what the students have been doing it, they, they think about the solutions and uh, whatever their solution is, they send me an email with their proposed solution and, and they discuss if they are in the right direction or um, does it make any sense or how we proceed from this point onward. So this is one possibility. The other possibility is tutorial. So we can definitely think about it. So I think a tutorial would be better because you'll be able to accommodate a lot more students this way. Sure, I will see. single setting. I will see. Okay. Also, sir, the uh, piece set, uh, you've given the solution template in a PDF. Oh, uh, I'll provide the text file. Okay, sir. Thank you. Now let's go to break. Hello, welcome back. Hello, are you all back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so M1 is the machine for D1, right? We can construct a similar machine M for D, right? As M1 just contains, uh, I mean, M1 recognizes the language of polynomials, which are for one variable, so we can just test. So for M1, we test x equal to zero, then plus minus one, plus minus two, and so on, right? Let's say there are multiple variables. Right? Let's say there is x1, x2, and x k variable. So what we can do, we can say, okay, uh, let's say x1 equal to zero, x2 equal to zero, x k equal to zero. Then we say, okay, x1 is equal to zero, x2 is equal to zero, and so on till xa equal to one. Then we can do for minus one and, and so on, right? So we can iterate over all possible things, possible. So we can, we, we know that both uh, m1 and m are recognizers and not this. So it means that, so when we say that M1 and M are recognized and not deciders, it means that suppose there is some polynomial P which is in the language P, or there's some polynomial P1 in language P1, uh, then our M1, M1 will eventually accept P1. Same thing is that M will eventually accept P. But suppose P does not belong to D or P1 does not belong to D1, then these machines will run forever, right? Run forever. Because they will never find out that, because they are just testing all integral possible solutions and there is no integral solution. And they will test all each and every solution and they will never. So since they will run forever, therefore they will never decide, right? Now, as I said that we can make small changes in, uh, in M1 uh, to make it a decider rather than, uh, rather than uh, a recognizer. And that is uh, whenever you have a polynomial, uh, let's say P is a polynomial, in just one variable x, just one way, right? It doesn't matter how, what is the degree of this polynomial, but just one variable. Then we can find some bounds. Okay. For x. 
to find the goods. Okay. So if so we say that if P is a polynomial, okay, and let's say P is a polynomial. degree k minus one, then the bounds are that the root of this polynomial would be within this number, which is plus minus k. So this k is a degree. K minus one is a degree. So plus minus k C max divided by C one. What is the C max? C max is the absolute maximum coefficient of any term and C1 is the coefficient of term with maximum degree. Since the maximum degree is k minus one, so it is the term, it is the coefficient of x minus, x power k minus one. Okay, so, so we know that the root, so the value of x would be between these two numbers. Now what we would do, we would try all possible values of X between this range. And if we get an answer that the polynomial evaluates to zero, we would say accept. And if we don't get uh, the value of the polynomial evaluated to be zero, then you would say that rich. So in that case, uh, our M1 will be converted into, into Turing decider. Okay, so a Turing machine would no longer be a Turing recognizer, rather a Turing decider. But there is no similar bound for any polynomial with multiple variables. Okay, so Yuri Matsevich, Theorem proves that no such bound for any polynomial with multiple variables. So he proved that there is no such polynomial, there is no such bound for polynomials with multiple variables. Therefore, therefore, D is not decidable. Okay. So we would use this word decidable very often from next week, maybe from next class. It will come again and again in our discussion. Is this in clear? Any questions? So Any questions? Sorry, the uh, formula for the roots that we wrote plus minus k c max upon c one. Is it some, Is it? Is this formula just for the polynomial of degree k minus one, or can we use this formula for any degree? This for any degree, right? So whatever is the degree, k will become plus one, right? Oh, okay, okay, got it. Thank you. Actually, this that k over here, it's it's, it's the number of terms. So I was not completely right when I said this is the power. Uh, this is basically the number of terms. So usually in a polynomial, uh, suppose that P of X is a polynomial. Uh, 
uh, with degree k, for example. Then there are k plus one branch, right? So at most k plus one. So there could be less than k plus one terms. For example, uh, let's say three x squared minus two x plus one is equal to zero, right? So how many terms we have? We have one term, two terms, and th three terms, right? So we have uh, 3x squared minus 2x1, you need power one, and one times x power zero. So we have a term with x power zero, we have a term with x power one, and we have a term with x power two. So, so degree is equal to two, and there are three terms. So if degree is equal to k, then there are k plus one terms, right? But this k plus one is the maximum number of terms, which I assumed when I said about the bound, but it is possible. Uh, let's say I have a polynomial, which is uh, five x power six minus x squared plus one equal to zero. This is a polynomial of degree, degree six, but there are only three terms, right? There are only three terms. So the k over here, is the is is the is the uh, is basically the number of terms. It's not the 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 num uh, I mean the degree of the polynomial. Rather, it's the number of terms. Uh, but since we assume that the num the polynomial will be complete in the sense that um, every term will exist there. Uh, so, for example, in this polynomial, uh, there is a term with x power five. There is a term with x power four. There is a term with x power three. But these coefficients are zeros. Right. Therefore, we don't include them. Uh, so this k is basically the, the number of terms. So when I say plus minus k c max divided by c1, so this k is basically the number of terms in the polynomial. Now, if the polynomial is the complete polynomial, then this will definitely correspond with the degree of the polynomial. So the degree would be k minus one, uh, but it doesn't have to correspond to the degree because we can have any number of terms. Right, and C max is the maximum absolute value of any coefficient. For example, in this particular polynomial, which we have written over here, uh, K would be three, right? Uh, C max, let's say, it may, let me make it. So C max is equal to seven. So it's the maximum absolute value. And C one is equal to five. So which is plus minus three times seven divided by five is the bound. So for, for this polynomial, if a root exists, that root must have, the integral root must have the value within this range. Right. So we can, we can check if you want. Anyway, is this in clear? Okay, as I said that uh, we would, yeah, thank you. So this decidability, This decidability is an important thing that we will be talking about a lot uh, from next class onwards. So how it will come. So for example, I say that A is a set. And I would define this set somewhere. Okay. And A must be a set of strings. If A is a set of strings, then A is a language. We will define this A in many different ways. So our questions would be, is A decidable? So whenever we say that is A decidable, we can replace this A with any language. Uh, the answer is either yes, it is decidable. So there are two possible answers. Answer is yes, or the answer is no, right? So what does this yes answer means? Yes answer means that there exists a Turing machine which decides A. And what does no means? No means there is 
no Turing machine which decides. And I think we are all clear that what is meant to decide. To decide means that if I bring any string from the language A, then the answer is yes. Then for that string, I should be able to know if that if that string belongs to the set A or if that string does not belong to, belong to the set, right? So we can answer membership queries Over here, we cannot answer membership queries. We can only answer the positive membership queries, but we cannot answer the negative membership queries because the machine may run into an infinite row, right? So decidability is very important. And we will see that there are many ways we can convert uh, the problems that we know from other branches of computer science, uh, which have nothing to do with languages and strings. We can all we can always convert them into a form, which is which is a form of string. And we can apply the knowledge that we have learned for Turing machine to see if there are decidable problems or not. Okay, so we will do one such problem right now. Okay, suppose I give you a graph. Okay. Suppose this is a graph. I'm not naming the vertices of this graph. Just imagine there are five vertices and uh, these are five edges. I can ask you this question. So let's call this graph G. My question is, is G connected? Is G connected? So what do you, what do you mean by connected? Okay, that's a good question. What, what is meant by a connected graph? A connected graph, a graph is called connected graph. So we are talking about undirected graph, okay? So we say that an undirected graph is called connected if there exists a path between any pair of vertices. Actually, it is different on this. Okay. So if there exists a path between any pair of vertices, then we say that that graph is connected. For example, so if I say that this is vertex one, this is vertex two, this is vertex three, vertex four, and vertex five, uh, there's a path between one and two, right? So there is this path between one and two. There's a path between two and two. Five, there's a path between two and four, three and four, one and four, and there's a path between one and four, right? There's a path between two and three. There's a path between one and five. There's a path between five and four. there's a path between five and three, and so on, right? So for every pair of vertices that we have in this graph, there exists a path. Now contrast it with the graph uh, that looks like this. Let's say I have a graph G1 uh, that looks like this. It looks very similar to the graph that we have in G, uh, but we don't have this edge, right? Now we know that there, there doesn't exist any path. So, so with these four vertices, vertices, there is a path between every pair. But if we include, when we include this vertex, which is isolated, there is no path between this vertex and any other vertex of the, of the rest, rest in the graph, rest of the graph, right? So this is, not connected or disconnected or unconnected. So G1 is unconnected graph while G is a connected graph, right? Now, the question of finding whether or knowing or to, to evaluating whether a graph is connected or not has nothing to do with languages, has nothing to do with strings, right? But we can solve such a problem using Turing strings and converting this problem into a problem of languages. And then from that languages, we can uh, solve, we can construct the Turing machine or not. So we can convert this connectivity issue into a membership query. So how can we do that? It's, it's very easy. So we said that, imagine that A is a language and this language contains encoding of the graph G, such that G 
is a connected cap. And what is meant by encoding? So when I say that this is a graph that contains vertex one connected with vertex two, and there's vertex three and vertex four, and there's vertex five. I can convert this graph into an encoding. And I think all of you have done some form of encoding. At least two encodings, everyone know. So you can always convert in a graph into an adjacency matrix. And you can always convert an undirected graph into adjacency. Yes. Right? So you can convert a graph into an adjacency matrix and into an adjacency list. Now, those things are basically the encoding of the graph. Okay. And that point actually gives us an important aspect and important insight into computers. For example, whatever that we do on computers <clears throat> eventually is processed by the processor and it is stored in, in chips, right? In memory chips and other things. And all that information is in the form of electrical signals. But at a higher level, we imagine, we assume that those electrical signals are basically responsible for saying zeros and ones. Everything that we do, everything that even does not include zero, that does not, that does not have anything to with, do with zeros and ones. For example, uh, we are talking, you can see me, you can hear my voice uh, and you can see me writing. All of that is a form of video and audio uh, stream, right? Whenever I, whatever I say, whatever that I write and, and the video and the audio is encoded in a form of electrical signals and that electrical signal is converted. I mean, first of all, it is, converted, it is digitized and that digital signal is basically the sequence of zeros and ones. And those sequence of zeros and ones are converted into electrical signals. And then they are sent to the right? Using, using the computer. And when your computer or phone or whatever device you have uh, receive those signals, it converts them back into meaningful information like a video and audio and, and text and so many, so, so forth. So we know that there exists an encoding for everything that we do. It could be an image, it could be a text, it could be a number, it could be anything. So when we have this graph, we can we know that we can encode it. We can encode it into some form of adjacency matrix and adjacency list. And even these encodings are at a higher level. We can go a little bit further and we, we can say that whatever encoding you have, you can, in, you can convert that in, encoding into a long strings of zeros and ones. And a long string of zeros and one is basically just a string, right? And we know that any string, if you have multiple strings, then a set or collection of strings is basically the language. Now I say that A is a language. It means that this is a language of all possible legal encodings of the graphs, such that all those graphs are connected. Now this, this language A is definitely an infinite language because we did not specify what is the bound, what are the bounds of the graph G. This, this graph G can, may contain one vertex or two vertices or four vertices or billions and trillions vertices. Similarly, we can, this, those graphs can contain any number of edges such that those edges make that graph a connected graph. So if there exists in any undirected connected graph, its encoding must exist in the language A. Do we need to define this language A explicitly? No. Do we need to write down and list down all possible elements of the set A? No. What we need to know is that what is the description of the set A? This set A contains encodings of all such undirected graphs such that those undirected graphs are connected. So if there's a graph which is unconnected, uh, there's a graph which is, un which is undirected and connected, its encoding must be there. Now, if this, is the set that contains all undirected connected graphs and codings of un undirected connected graphs. I said there is a graph G. Okay. There is a graph, let's say there's a graph G and I know I, I can find out its encoding by following exactly the same procedure uh, which we use for all other graphs. Then we can say that, does this encoding belong to A or not? If the answer is yes, then it means that G is connected. And if the answer is no, it means that it is unconnected. Right? 
right? Is this thing clear? Now, so my claim is that we can construct a machine M, a Turing machine M, which decides A. So this A is a decidable language. A is decidable. How can we construct a Turing machine for this? Can anyone come up with an idea? Any idea? Now, from this point onwards, we would not write Turing machines in terms of graphical presentation. So it is enough to give an algorithmic description of a Turing machine, and that's it. We don't have to go into lower level of saying that what is the state control and what are the transitions and, and, and things like that. We would give a higher level descriptive version of the Turing machine. So we say that M decides A and how this M will work. So we say that M is a machine which will receive the input G, right? So suppose this is the input. On the input G, we know that what is this G? G is the encoding of the graph. What does it have to do? It has to select so it is very similar to what you would actually do in real life. For example, if you are given this graph and you want, I, I ask you to write um, this algorithm in Java or C or C++ or Python, what you would do? You would say, okay, I, I see this graph. So let's consider, let me let me mark this vertex, the, any vertex for that matter. So randomly pick a vertex and mark it red. Okay, so we we have read this uh, read this this vertex and and mark all those vertices which are connected by the vertex one. So this vertex is connected, so let's mark it. This vertex is connected. Is there any other vertex which is connected by one and unmarked? No. Then what you would do, you would pick one of the marked vertices. Okay, one more mark. Any of the vertices which are connected by one. So let's pick this one. And mark all those vertices which are connected by two. So you mark this one and you mark this one. Okay, and then what you would do, you would say, okay, pick one more. Um, so you would check one thing. Is there any other unmarked vertex or not? Since there are no unmarked vertices and you just followed the path from a vertex to another vertex and that path means that there was a connection and, and, and you were able to mark each and every vertex in the graph. Therefore, this graph is right. Now think about a graph, another graph. Let's say uh, we have this graph exactly the same graph that we had in the previous example, uh, but this vertex is not okay. So you would say, okay, mark this vertex and mark all those vertices which are connected by this vertex. Now you check, is there any unmarked vertex or not? If there is a, some unmarked vertex, what you would do, you would pick one vertex which is connected by this vertex which you started with and see what are the vertices which, which are connected by this. One. This is connected by this one. Okay, now check, is there any other vertex which is unmarked? Yes, there is vertex which is unmarked, okay? And then you can pick all the vertices, pick all the vertices and you would see that it is impossible to mark this. Therefore, it is not connected. Okay, so we can, we can do exactly the same thing over here and we would say select the first node. And this first is arbitrary. Okay, and mark it. Then we say repeat the following until no new nodes are. Okay. You say for each node, you mark it if it is attached or connected by an edge to a node that is already marked. Okay. 
once you have done it, scan all the nodes of G to test whether they are marked. If yes, accept. Otherwise, this. And this decides it because it gives both inputs, uh, both outputs, except as well as reject. So it, it decides. And similarly, we can convert many different problems which are seemingly unrelated with any uh, strings or languages. We can convert them into a form of uh, strings and languages and apply the knowledge from theory case. Uh, it's a kind of DFS, so we don't have to call it DFS. It's not DFS. It doesn't matter what you call it. Is this thing clear? Any questions? Okay, from this point onwards, our course will become more theoretical uh, in the sense that most of the time we will be doing uh, proofs and uh, other things, other similar things. Okay, so you have to be very attentive. Okay, any question? Sir, ये जो हम लोगों ने पीछे पीछे पढ़ा है उसके अंदर हमें कुछ समझ नहीं आ रहा है तो उसके लिए कोई ट्यूटोरियल वगैरह है या नहीं? मुश्किल लग रहे हैं समझने में शायद हमें नहीं आ रहे हैं तो अगर हम प्रैक्टिस करेंगे साथ बैठ के सोल्व करते रहेंगे तो Just, uh, no, my question is, did you read the book? I'm asking, did you read the book? Yes, sir. Book में है read करी लेकिन practice जब करते हैं ना sir तो questions जा रहे कुछ नहीं समझ आते तो हम उसको skip कर देते हैं दूसरे question पाते हैं वो जहाँ पे कुछ समझ आता है उसपे skip कर देते हैं मतलब कोई अगर एक मतलब साथ हम बैठ के करें तो शायद कुछ हो जाए There are two people talking at the same time. Sorry. Yeah, I can understand. I can understand the the issue and uh, that issue is very. Uh, I mean, it's it's a legitimate issue. It's a fair uh, question. They have to resolve how to solve question. And yeah, the only answer is is practice, right? So it doesn't matter if I solve one question or two or ten in front of you, unless you do it yourself, you will never learn. It. So you will have a very good feeling attending those tutorials and classes, or that you understood three problems or five problems, and now you know how to solve them. Uh, but any unknown problem that I will uh, show to you, or if any unknown problem comes in exam. Or in problem sets or any other place, uh, you will be again at the same place. So, the right approach is to do it yourself. I can only give you some examples and see and show that how it applies, and then you need to think about a solution for unknown problem. And um, unless you do the practice uh, yourself, you will not learn. So this course is all about whatever we are doing. It's it's very close to mathematics. It's it's computer science, but Its the sense is is mathematics. So as mathematics is only learned using practice, practice. So you need to practice in this one as well. So whatever questions that I give you in problem sets, try them. Uh, maybe you would not be able to solve it in the first attempt. That's perfectly fine. Do it again and again and again. Or uh, maybe after three, four attempts, you you can uh, understand. And that's why I allowed that you can collaborate on problem sets among uh, your friends, so you can come up with a group uh, and you can talk about uh, the solutions and ideas and 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 share the solutions and ideas because uh, you might come up with an with, with an intuition which is different from anyone else's understanding of the question, and that may help everyone in the group. 
So it's better to uh, talk about uh, those problems in a group setting and you will eventually find it. Uh, but whenever you are stuck, please let me know and I will try to figure out uh, a way to tell you that how to resolve that issue. Uh, sometimes I give hints, sometimes I give the solution, uh, but I try to avoid it. So I, I, I don't want to give away the solution because uh, giving away a solution is not learning, right? So you would not learn or you would not learn much from that. So I, I like to give hints uh, so that you think yourself and, and you walk on, on the path rather than, uh, I mean, I, I don't like to hold hands. So yes, tutorials will help. And I will I, I will plan to conduct some tutorials uh, in the coming weeks. Um, but tutorial is not the exclusive way to do it, right? So I would suggest that you practice more and more. Okay, whenever you are stuck, just let me know and we will figure it out together. Okay. Thank you. So in that case, we will end the class today and from uh, next class, from Saturday's class, uh, we will start a new topic uh, and the name of the topic is uh, decided. It's basically the next chapter. That is chapter number four in, in, in the book. And we will use uh, Decided. We will not cover each and every result in, in, in this chapter, um, but we will cover most of, most of the stuff, most of the tools. Okay, uh, with this, I think um, we can end the class. So thank you very much for your time. And I'll see you on Saturday. Thank you. And goodbye, everyone.